Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives, and give us a call, uh, 208-991-4783, and be sure to fill out our listener survey, survey.greatdetectives.net. This episode of the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio is brought to you by the a faithful support of our great listeners. Thank you so much. Well, as I mentioned last week, we're skipping pretty far ahead just because of lost episodes. We had uh, previously 19 weeks straight of having all the episodes available, uh, and that was followed by 19 weeks of lost episodes. And I'll read off uh, the titles after the show, because some of them sounded pretty uh, interesting. But this particular episode comes from July 8th, 1952. It's the episode, The Long Way Home. So enjoy. Tim Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. It's a sad fact, but very few murderers ever amount to anything. They're in such a killing profession, and when they come to the end of their rope... There's always a noose attached to it. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Craig speaking. Ever noticed the fact that the work a man does leaves its mark on him? Nine times out of ten, you can spot a doctor, a lawyer, a butcher, a baker half a block away. I wonder what a confidential investigator looks like. <laughs> he looks like me. I figured the above philosophy represented a good day's work. The shadows were creeping along Madison Avenue, and I got out of the office. And I locked the door behind me. Maybe I could fool a burglar into thinking I had something worth stealing. I hoped I wasn't waking Jake. A night elevator man needs his sleep. Something was wrong. He'd started the elevator up almost before I'd finished pushing the buzzer. You can spoil tenants awful fast that way. Jake? Hey. You suffering from insomnia? No. You've been reading a book on how to get ahead in the world? No. Well, uh, stop chattering and let's get started. Well, you got the door shut fine. Now we're supposed to go down. Oh, glad you reminded me. They didn't have any elevators down on your farm in Vermont. No. It figures. No office buildings, neither. That figures, too. No shiny cars, no blondes. What did you do during the long winter evenings? Decided to leave the farm, Mr. Craig. <laughs> well, right about now is when you open the elevator door. Ain't sure I should. Why? Taint the farm. Meaning uh, we've got elevators, office buildings, shiny cars, and uh, a blonde? Yep. I'm not afraid of blondes. Back in Vermont, it was a pop usually carried the gun. But here? She's carrying it. Must be a strain on her. Open up, Jay. Yep. Where'd you hide her? The shiny car. Outside? That's the one. Oh, I like them that shape. Long, rounded, smooth. You mean the car? Oh, sure. As far as the blonde goes, there's not a wrinkle or a gun on her. A bag. Oh. I see it when she powdered her nose. Well, uh, maybe it's a trick cigarette case. No. She could be waiting for somebody else. Nobody else in the building. Then I'd better not keep her waiting. After all, you can only die once. Once is enough. Don't remind me. Besides, blondes rarely have any reason to shoot me. Boasting? Just being wistful. Good night, Jake. Night, Mr. Craig. Well, I've been waiting long. Not very. Beautiful night. Isn't it? The name's Craig. I know. Well, Jake could be wrong. 
Who's Jake? The night man. He wasn't wrong. Then I get in? Please. Okay. Well, the name's still Craig. I'm Mona Walsh. Mrs. Walsh? Mrs. Walsh. How's Mr. Walsh? Uh, that's why I was waiting for you. We're going to see him? I hope not. I could think of an easy explanation. Mona Walsh had seen me, had been carried away by my rugged physique and my mildly scrambled features, and was now carrying me off to a tryst among the pines, or maybe the maples. It was too easy an explanation, and it didn't include the gun. We're going someplace or just cruising? I'm trying to find words, the best way to tell you. I've been a confidential investigator for quite a while. You don't have to find the best way. My husband isn't Mr. Walsh. He's Ted Walsh. Well, what difference is that? Wait a minute. Ted Walsh? That's right. The Ted Walsh. If I remember my newspaper headlines correctly, he's killed a few men here and there. Yes. His last little effort was robbing a bank someplace in Massachusetts. And killing a guard. And killing a guard. Nice guy. I didn't know what he was when I married him. You probably won't believe that. If you turn out to be a client of mine, I'll have to believe it. But it's true. I didn't know until just recently. When I found out, I left him. Came here to New York. Fair enough. You're in the clear. What's bothering you? Ted's in New York, too. New York's a big place. Ted's terribly in love with me. He came here for only one reason. You could keep your door locked. Oh, please don't joke. I wasn't joking. Keep your door locked and your telephone handy. The police would be glad to remove him from your doorstep. Ted would spot them. Then he'd know I told the police about him. He'd get away from them. He's done it before. He'd kill me. Possible. But if you watched for him, he wouldn't spot you. Then as soon as he came... You carry a gun, don't you? I've got a license, too. Well, then everything would be all right, wouldn't it? Might be. That'd be a fee. I, I thought perhaps 500. Well, that's too high. I generally get 50 a day in expenses. Well, that doesn't seem enough. I run a one-price shop. Well, all right. This your place? Yes. Well, let's get out. Small house. Stay there alone? Yes. I can see why you'd worry. Uh, I, I feel nervous. It's exposed standing around like... Well, we'll try the house. I'd better go in with you. Of course. In case he's a little early. Oh, I hadn't thought of... Don't get excited. I'm probably too careful. But we'll check anyway. Got your key? Oh, here. Uh... Over to the side, huh? What? The lamppost out front throws some light. The house is dark. You'd make a nice target. Oh, all right. Yeah. So far, fine. Light switch near the door? To the left. On the way inside. Okay. Stay where you are. Clear enough. Come on in. Got a latch on it? Uh-huh. Good. Rest of the house now. I feel like a termite inspector. Except, uh, termites don't kill, do they? Mr. Walsh was not at home. Mrs. Walsh felt good about it. I didn't have time to get, uh, philosophical about marriage. I checked the back of the house for good measure. A high fence took care of the garden and the back door. It was only the front door to worry about. You're alone in the house, Mrs. Walsh. Yes. When I shut this door behind me, you'll lock it. Of course. Then if your husband comes calling... I'll be safe. You won't have to use that gun you're carrying around anyway. Uh, you, you'll be out front someplace? Yeah. The nearest convenient doorway. I'll find one. It's one of the things you learn fast in my business. How to find convenient doorways. So long, Mrs. Walsh. So long. There was a small night light over the door. That was nice. It would light up Mr. Walsh neatly if he visited. 
I had my choice of two or three doorways from which I could watch the Walsh house and be close enough to have a clean shot at Ted Walsh. I passed them all up. I was looking for a phone, and I found one in a drugstore half a block away. Craig here. Aloof tonight, eh? Watch those college words. People will think you're educated. I am. Tonight you're not ashamed of being a college graduate, Lieutenant? I'm all alone in the office. Mm. Nobody will ever find out. I'll tell them, Trev. Unless I do what? <laughs> no blackmail. I want some information, though. You might have it. You flatter the department. It's about Ted Walsh. Walsh? We'd like some information about him, too. For example, where to get in touch with him. I haven't got it. Trav, on that bank job he pulled in Massachusetts, was it a solo flight? A bank job's never solo, especially one involving $60,000. But Walsh was definitely in on it. So definitely, he killed a guard. Thanks, Trav. Hey, uh, wait a minute. My curiosity's around. Try a cold shower. Good night, Trav. <laughs> what it was worth was that I went back to Mrs. Walsh's little gray home in the west. It looked the same. I pushed the button. Who is it? Mary Craig. Leave the door on the chain, but open it a crack, huh? All right. What's the matter? I've decided to throw up the job. What? Yeah, I'm resigning. But I don't understand. It's a clear saving of 50 bucks for you. Why are you... Let's say the hours are too long, huh? Good night, Mrs. Walsh. She was saying something as I went down the walk and away from the house. I didn't bother listening. I had to drop her. You see, I always believe a client, and Mona Walsh, however beautiful, was a liar. But however much of a liar she was, Mona Walsh was beautiful. So I hung around in one of those convenient doorways... With me apparently off the job, she'd need somebody else to keep Ted Walsh away from her. There wasn't much time left either. She wouldn't take a chance trying to find another gullible private detective. I was interested in who she would find. It took maybe a half hour for my replacement to show up. He was an anti-doorway boy. He picked an alley. I thought he looked lonely, so I dropped in on him. Hello. What? Hey, who? The name's Craig, Barry Craig. What do you want? I'm trying to find out what's special about this alley. Nothing. I'm crazy about alleys, that's all. You're sticking to that? Sure. Then uh, let's go. I oh. thought you'd be packing one. What? You ain't got no right taking a guy's gun. I'm a lot bigger than you are. Would you like to argue about it? Well, there's a, there's a dame in that house. Ted Walsh's wife. She's kind of worried he might show. She doesn't love him anymore? Well, I wouldn't know nothing about that. The orders was he don't get to her. What does he get? Never mind. Who's got all the big concern for Mona Walsh? Oh, why don't you leave me alone? What's your angle? Maybe I want to send your boss flowers because he's a humanitarian. Feed me a name. I didn't tell you nothing, understand? Of course. It's, uh... Mr. Harold. Harold? Yeah, but remember, you didn't get it from me. I'll remember. Here's your gun. Oh, yeah. I'm worried about Mona Walsh, too. Oh, you don't have to worry about her. Nobody will get the jump on me again. I hope not. So long. We start with the kid stuff. Snatch and run. Knock over a couple of small stores. Move up into the hot cars and cold decks. Go on to delivering boats a few seasons. Take over a few wheels. Buy a few deaths and you wind up being Mr. Harold. But by then you wear tailored suits and handmade shoes. Now, what's the idea this hour? The Their name's Craig. Oh. Oh, Craig. I've seen the face around. Wait a minute now. You a private eye? Call it confidential investigator. Makes it seem more dignified. Yeah, well, call it what you want, but get out of here. Not until I see Harold. Let's make it Mr. Harold, huh? And he ain't seeing you. 
You ain't the type that appeals to him. He's seeing me. You pushing your luck or something? When I say you don't see Mr. Harold, you don't see him. So far, it's only your word. It's more than a word. Everybody's got one. Yours licensed? No, you care. Keep pushing and you're a trespasser. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Harold. What's the uh, trouble? Yeah, I'm having words with a private eye who wants in. Oh, indeed. Uh, let him in, Bogan. I haven't seen one in years. Okay. Who knows? He may want to have his license renewed. Not exactly. The name's Craig. Uh, Bogan, put that gun away and leave us, hmm? Yeah, okay, Mr. Harold. Bogan is so impulsive. A little crude, too, or haven't you noticed? He, uh, doesn't polish easily. It's getting late, uh... What's half of $60,000, Harold? $30,000. That kind of money worth a debt? I haven't seen the latest quotations. Ted Walsh knocked over a bank a couple of weeks ago, killed a guard, and collected $60,000. Hmm, an enterprising young man. He had a little help. The way I figure, it was 30000 for Ted, 30000 for uh, the help. Seems equitable enough, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but Harold, uh, how do you share the debt? <laughs> needed a little time. I let him have it. The room was nice. Good furniture. Oak paneling on the walls. Small Renoir hung just where the light would hit in the morning. A girl brushing her hair before a mirror. She looked like someone I'd seen, and for a minute I couldn't remember where. She looked like the girl who'd married Ted Walsh. You uh, must have some interest in the uh, rather sordid subject of Ted Walsh and his uh, peccadilloes. Why? Mona Walsh. She tried to hire me. She's a lovely girl. You wouldn't hire? She lied to me. Sad. She wanted me to protect her against her husband. She'd heard he was here in New York. She didn't tell me who told her. Why? I really couldn't say. She wanted me to stake out in front of her house. So when Walsh got there, I'd take him. But Harold, uh, how would Ted Walsh have found her house? She wouldn't have told him, not if she was really afraid of him. Isn't all this Mona Walsh's problem? No, uh, Ted Walsh alive gets half of the $60,000. Ted Walsh dead gets a mouthful of dust in Potter's Field. How picturesque. The problem is uh, how to kill Ted Walsh without annoying the police. The answer is, hire a private detective, let Ted Walsh know where his lovely wife is, and uh, he heads for her. The private detective kills him. All nice and legal. I suppose it would be. Uh... Harold, you picked me to kill Ted Walsh you're, for you. You're ruining my tie. Sorry, I have trouble with my temper sometimes. I don't like being a hired gun, Harold. You turned the job down, didn't you? What more do you want? I don't know. Maybe I'm worried because a liar is so lovely. I got out of there. I could have gone to lots of other places after that, but I didn't. I went back to my office and sat. I didn't have any doubts. Harold had set up Mona Walsh as a decoy. When I cried quits, one of his men moved in to protect her. Harold wanted Ted Walsh dead so he could hold on to all of the 60000 And maybe Mona Walsh, too. It was an idea I didn't enjoy. I stopped having it. I was waiting without knowing what I was waiting for. I thought it might be nice if I had a Renoir to hang next to the dusty license on the wall. Then I thought of the people and the motives that kept me in business. I decided the Renoir wouldn't fit. The hours dragged by and I stopped kidding myself. Nobody phoned. Nobody would phone. I'd get up and go home and go to sleep. I got up... But I didn't go home. The street in front of Mona Walsh's house was empty and cold. The lights in Mona Walsh's house were out. And the boy in the alley wasn't there anymore. I was wrong. I hadn't gone deep enough. The alley closed in on me and then... I found him. He was propped up against the wall, his legs straight out before him, his head slumped down over his chest. 
He might have been brooding about the blood that had poured out of that chest if he hadn't been so completely dead. I left him there. He'd keep. He'd been dead some little while. Somebody had shot him. It got past him into Mona Walsh's house. The lock on Mona Walsh's front door was in fine shape, except that the door wasn't locked. The living room was the way I'd remembered it. I went into the bedroom. She had fallen back across the bed. The stain on the front of her dress hadn't been her dressmaker's idea. Uh, hello? Mrs. Walsh. I th- thought I'd hope maybe I'd see you again. Hold it. Emergency. An ambulance. 435 Ash. Gunshot wound. And make it quick. Yeah. Mr. Craig? Better not talk. Why? There'll be a doctor here in a couple of minutes. You've seen people like this before. I should be dead. Will you stop talking? No, I won't. What do you want me to do? Think about what my life has been. Shouldn't have married Ted. It's bad. Now you don't have to. I'm make... not making excuses. Only things happen. You lie about them, even to yourself. Now I don't have to lie anymore. Once the doctor gets here, oh, you. Oh, please. It's all going so fast now. Kiss me. Good night. Hey. I... When I was a little girl, my father always. police arrived and made noises and were very busy. Mona Walsh didn't pay attention to any of them. Barry? Yes, Lieutenant. We haven't been able to get a thing. A couple of the neighbors heard the shots but thought they were a car backfiring. That happens. Which gives us the time Mrs. Walsh and the character in the alley were killed. An hour and ten minutes ago. Does knowing that make you feel any better? With all the deaths you've seen, Barry, you ought to be a little more callous about new ones. Maybe I don't try hard enough. Stay the way you are. It's better. Otherwise, you lose humanity. None of us can afford that. They teach you that in college? It's not taught anywhere. It's something you either know or don't know. Our policeman isn't supposed to give lectures, though, so... Ted Walsh is out in the open now. He must have holed up for the last couple of weeks, but... Uh, we know he's in New York now. We'll get him. Yeah, Mind if I get out now? No. Where are you going? We could uh, kill a few bears after I'm through here. Thanks, but not tonight, Sam. Because, you see, I... I won't be through for maybe uh, longer than that. I wasn't holding out on Trav. I had to be sure. There was only one place I could think of that might help. If I were Ted Walsh, I'd go visit Harold. I wasn't Ted Walsh, but I went to visit him anyway. I always enjoy driving. It was a nice night for it. The only thing wrong was uh, a red stain on a girl's dress. There was a car parked outside Harold's house. It started pulling away as I came up. I didn't try to figure out anything subtle. I just cut my wheel right into it. Both cars stopped quick. I was out of mine before Bogan could quite make it. But he made it out of his car. Hello, Bogan. Well, I don't know what's for your drive. Yeah, uh, me. Oh, oh, you don't want the gun, but I do. Why, you bitch. You'll wake the neighbors. Thanks for the gun. Yeah. Hey, warm, and it's been fired. Within very recent history. Now, listen. Let's see if there's anything else in your car, huh? No. Nothing that moves. Bogan? Yeah. I can't take the time to deliver you. I'll have to put you on deposit for a little while. (laughs) 
he'd keep. I thought Mr. Harrell might still be at home. Worrying about his car, maybe. Logan, what? Oh, Craig. We'll go inside. Now, look here. I've got Bogan's gun. All right. What do you want? Your car's in a bad way. That crash? Yeah, I'm a careless driver. Was Bogan hurt? He'll live. I, I, I'm going to call for a doctor for him. No. Now, now look here. This is perfectly... Per- You're nervous. Per- I haven't anything further to say to you, Craig. One man's opinion. Yours. I don't share it. You must have looked into the car. I did. Well, that can be explained easily. Explain it easily. You saw Ted Walsh's body in the back of the car. He was a killer. He apparently thought his wife and I had been uh, a little too friendly. Had you? Well, you know how it is, Craig. I don't know. Well, anyway, he came here. Threatened to kill me, so... Well, Bogan beat him to it, that's all. It was a case of self-defense. It would stand up at any court. Sure. Oh, there's no reason to lose your head. I haven't lost it. Where was Bogan delivering the body? To the aquarium? Well, you see, Bogan's record isn't too good. He was afraid the police might not readily accept a plea of self-defense. He wanted to dispose of the body. I, well, I tried to dissuade him, but I failed. As a matter of fact, I was just about to notify the police myself. Oh, I'm sure you were. I think you'll find the bullets in Ted Walsh's body came from Bogan's gun. I don't doubt it. Well, then, that sort of leaves me out of it, doesn't it? How about the bullets in the body of the boy you sent to guard Mona Walsh? How about the bullets in Mona Walsh's body? They, they're dead? They're dead. Oh, that's terrible. Sure. Ted must have got to them. He had a gun. The bullets in those bodies would have come from his gun. Don't you mean the gun you planted on him? Mr. Harold looked a little sick. His face matched the way I felt. For a minute, I wished I'd developed those calluses Trav mentioned. Then I forgot about it. Mr. Harold retreated behind his desk. Planted on him? Ted Walsh came here before he went to visit his wife. For his share of the bank money. Walsh died here. Bogan saw to that. But you still didn't own all of that 60000 Mona Walsh might be considered to have a claim to half of it. So you decided to wipe out that claim. You're, you're dreaming. You're headed for a house. You had to take care of the boy in the alley. Walsh would have had to in order to get to Mona. You took care of him. Then you went into the house and entered the partnership between you and Mona Walsh. No. Yeah. You came back here, planted the gun you'd used on Ted Walsh. Bogan would dump his body where it wouldn't be found for a while. That way, no medical examiner could tell that Walsh had died before his wife. That, that's very clever. You've got nothing to prove it with. There's Ted Walsh's body. Examination now will show he died before Mona did. A good lawyer... I've got something else. Something that told me Ted Walsh hadn't killed his wife before I even came here. What's that? An unlocked door. I don't know what that means. Mona Walsh's door was unlocked when I got to her house. The lock hadn't been tampered with, which meant Mona had opened that door. But she wouldn't have opened it to her husband. She was afraid of him. She'd have opened it for you, Harold. I... You've been fumbling in that desk drawer long enough. Bring the gun up. Maybe you'll beat me to the shot, huh? I, I don't want to get involved. You're involved. There's nothing left except maybe a chance to take me. Well? Okay, Harold. You're better, much better at killing women. Let's go tell some cops about it, huh? You've been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Long Way Home, was written by Lou Vittis. Next week, it's the strange story titled Dead Reckoning, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, matter triumphs over mind when a corpse with no head for figures starts pitching his weight around with yours truly playing catch. Good night, folks. See you next week. Featured in the role of Mona was Barbara Weeks. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking.
Welcome back. Uh, this is another episode where uh, Gargan just does a fantastic job portraying Craig as having this uh, a sense of right and wrong. That really, uh, when you're dealing with the hard-boiled uh, detective uh, in its origins, was very uh, critical. They's uh, at their best uh, in kind of the Philip Marlowe mold are good men operating in a world full of bad people. And certainly that's uh, where Craig uh, lines up in this particular episode. Well, I did mention I'd, m I'd discuss all the episodes we missed here. So the lost episode titles, Murder in Mink, Key Witness, Unknown Corpse, The Masked Mermaid, Love That Kills, Cry for Help, Top Secret, the Drowned Ghost, The Hired Killer, Talent for Murder, A Night in Istanbul, The Finger Man, The Client Was a Corpse, Prize, Captive, Husband for Hire, Corpse on a Carousel, Murder in Motion, and The Big Kill, which actually sounds like a Dragnet episode. Oh, and Shroud for a Fugitive. Thankfully, we only have, only have 11 lost episodes between this episode and the next uh, set of episodes uh, which come in October of 1952. All right, well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback. Uh, Barry Craig is the best. Johnny Dollar is a close second. High praise indeed for the top uh, continental uh, confidential investigator. And there might even be uh, a case that uh, during the time that Barry Craig was airing, that Barry Craig was as good or better than uh, the Johnny Taller episodes, uh, particularly of John Lund and Edmund O'Brien. No, no, but uh, good comment there. And then finally, love the show, been listening for two years, and you just keep getting better and better. Well, thank you so much for your great comments and support. Really appreciate it. Be sure to send uh, your comments uh, to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, take our listener survey, survey.greatdetectives.net. And I'd encourage you, if you're on Facebook and you haven't already, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. As of this recording, we have 967 friends on Facebook. I'd love to be at 1,000 come uh, October 26th when we celebrate our second uh, full year and begin to move into the third season. And uh, be sure and give us a call if you'd like to, 208-991-4783. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.